In this video, I'm dropping my paid vending machine course for free. Having a vending machine business has greatly benefited me and as an entrepreneur, I would like to help as many people as possible and I felt like this was a good way of achieving this. A favor that I would like to ask is if you can please like and subscribe, that honestly means so much to me. In the course, my dialogue is more conversational, natural and free and if at times you feel like I'm speaking a little bit too slow in the course, feel free to speed it up. I really do hope that y'all get good value out of this. And again, if you could please subscribe, it would honestly mean so much to me. So now we're just gonna dive straight into the course. So thank you for joining me on this course. I just wanted to do a very, very quick intro. So my name's Amit Pong. I'm a 21 year old entrepreneur and I run a vending machine business. The reason why I wanted to make this course is because when I started this business myself, there was very, very limited resources. There was literally no resources at all or not much information whatsoever in regards to actually running a vending machine business and starting one. And that's the reason why I took it upon myself to produce this course, so that I could give you better insights and to actually have to do this business for yourself. When I started this business, I made a lot of mistakes because I was just doing it pretty much as I went along. And these mistakes did cost me. They were costly mistakes. And I wanna put this course out there so that I can prevent you from making the same mistakes and ultimately to help you. So. Ultimately, what this course is, is it's a blueprint. I go through, I'm going to go through everything to explain how to do this business for yourself, how to start it, all of the ins and outs and all of the little insights that I've picked up through my own experience running this business myself. When it comes to vending machine businesses in general, it is something that I do find quite enjoyable as a stream of passive income. It's very, very low in terms of like time investment and it just generally is quite enjoyable once you actually have the business set up and things like that. Managing it going forward is so much easier. So it definitely is a business that is quite lucrative and something I do enjoy myself. So I'm excited that you're all joining me on this course. And yeah, we're just gonna get straight into it in the next few lessons. So in this section, I wanted to go over some expectations in terms of profit and things that you can expect from this business. Obviously, if you're looking to start this business as a source of passive income, you're gonna be very, very interested to know how much you can actually make from it. It's very, very important. So that's exactly what we're gonna go over. When it comes to vending machine business, when you're first starting out, off a single vending machine, you're not gonna make a significant profit. You'll make some decent money on the side, but it's not gonna be anything, it's not gonna be anything too much. It's gonna be some decent money on the side, but that's all it will be. It'll be a bit of money on the side. It does help, but it's just a bit of money. The real money that comes within this business is from scaling. It is all about scaling. And it's like that with really any business. If you're interested in real estate and you wanna go down that way, it's gonna be the exact same thing. You're not gonna get rich off one house. It's gonna be multiple things. So it's like that for a lot of businesses. It's all about scaling. And with this business, it isn't anything different. When it comes to the actual figures of how much you'll make, it does depend on a lot of factors, such as the location, how good of a location you choose, factors look such as how busy the location is, what the location has around it, things like that how much commission you're paying. There's so many factors like that. So when it comes to an actual benchmark figure, it does vary a lot. But for me, typically, per vending machine comfortably, because I don't like to sell any false expectations, per vending machine comfortably, I'd expect to make minimum 200 to 250 pound profit per machine. Now, like I said, this may not seem like a whole lot, and this is a very, very low figure that I'm given, because I don't want to give any higher figure. This for me, would be the minimum that you can expect to make from one machine. But again, it may not seem like a lot, but the true money comes from scaling. If you have one vending machine and it's making you 200 pound a month, 250, if you buy another two, three, four vending machines, now you're tripling, now you're quadrupling your money. Now you're making 800 pound of four machines. If you have five machines, now you're making a thousand pound. And that's if each machine is making you a minimum of 200 pound a month, which again is quite a low figure. Vending machines, it depends on location. They can do so much better than that. But I'm just giving you this as a very, very low benchmark, just so you know what to expect and just to set the right expectation. So essentially to clarify, with vending machines, when you're first starting out and you place your first machine, the money that you get from that machine will be some nice money on the side. But the real money from vending machines comes from scaling. Scaling has so much power within this business like it does in so many other businesses. Okay, so in previous sections, we've gone over, we did a little quick intro. We talked about some expectations. What can you expect from this business? Now we're actually gonna start talking about the process. 
So the very first thing is finding the vending machine. When it comes to finding the vending machine, especially for your first one, personally, I would recommend going for a used machine. The reason why I'd recommend going for a used machine is because you'll save so much more money. When it comes to this business, it's like any single business, it's all about starting. It doesn't have to be perfect, it doesn't have to be great. It's just about starting. So you just wanna get a decent vending machine. Now, when it comes to what to look for in a vending machine, especially a used one, overall, you just wanna make sure the vending machine is in good working condition. If you're buying a vending machine off a private seller, it's very, very important that you test the vending machine fully, you make sure it's working. Do not be shy at all in the process. At the end of the day, this is your money, this is your investment, and you need to make sure that's fully working. Take as much time as you need to test the vending machine. You wanna make sure that all the slots are running correctly. You wanna make sure that the vending machine is updated to accept new currency. And the way that you can check that is, well, simply by asking, but again, put a pound coin and test it. Make sure that the coin mechanism is working. Every vending machine comes with a coin mechanism and the coin mechanism is the part in the vending machine that accepts currency. So you wanna make sure that this is updated to accept a new pound coin. Very, very simple. Another thing when you're checking the vending machine is you wanna inspect the physical condition of the vending machine. At the end of the day, you're gonna be taking this vending machine and putting it into a business. And for that reason, you wanna kinda of look at it like the vending machine represents you. That, and, th and that's why you wanna make sure that it's in good condition and that's acceptable. You, you want the vending machine Again, so ultimately, you want to take pride in it. So you want to, because ultimately, when you're pitching into a business, this vending machine, it is going to represent you. So for this reason, when you're looking at the vending machine, make sure there's no major damage to it, no major knocks. It's okay if it has a little bit of wear and tear. It's up to your own discretion to decide what's acceptable and things like that. But as long as it has no major damage, no major bumps, then honestly, it is fine. Another thing as well is, Check the keypad, make sure the keypad isn't worn off too much. If it is, you can sort of like glass over that and you can like touch that up yourself and things like that. It certainly is possible if it isn't too bad, if it's only minor, if some of the keys are a little bit like worn down, you can kind of like go over that a little bit yourself if needs be, but that's only in the case, that's only in the case that it is minor. So you have to sum up with the condition, test it fully, make sure that it's working correctly and that physically the vending machine isn't too damaged because again i know i keep on saying this but the vending machine represents you when you're putting it in a business you're making an agreement between you and the business and this vending machine is going to represent you it's going to represent your business it's an extension of you so it's very very important that you make sure that it's very very presentable and you have it have it looking as good as possible when it comes to where to actually look for a vending machine especially used one the best places that I always do recommend is Facebook Marketplace, eBay, and Gumtree. Now, these days, it seems as though it's harder to get vending machines on the market. And the thing that I'd recommend with that is I'd recommend a few things. So the very first thing that I would recommend is go on each of these platforms, go on Gumtree, go on eBay, go on Facebook, and create search alerts so that when a vending machine is listed within your area, you'll be the first person to be notified and you can act on it as quick as possible. It's possible to get a vending machine, definitely, but it does seem to be a little bit more challenging to get a vending machine, so you need to be a bit more on the ball with it. So, very simple, go to each of the platforms respectively, create a search alert so that you'll be the first person to be notified when there's one available in your area. Okay, so that's the first thing that I'd recommend when it comes to searching for a vending machine. Another thing that I'd recommend as well is, if you are struggling to find a vending machine within your area, something that I would recommend is extend your search area. Look for vending machines no more than an hour and a half away. Search for, change your radius and change it to an hour and a half away from you. And if you do see vending machines there, what I'd recommend is, if you see a machine there, obviously it's an obstacle, but if you can't find it in your area, then you need to do this. What you'll do is you'll find a moving company or someone with a van that offers moving services in the area that the vending machine is, and you'll contact them and essentially what you'll do is you'll have them move the vending machine from that location that's away from you and then bring it to you directly. So in that sense, it's only one trip because the person's already in the location and they're bringing it to you. And this is personally something that I did myself. So when I was buying my very first vending machine, the vending machine was an hour away from me. 
So that's exactly what I did. I contacted, I contacted someone within that area an hour away from me and they brought directly to me and that cost me about 50, 60 pound. Yes, I think that would cost me 60 pound. So in the end, what I did, even though there was no vending machines around me or they were a little bit too expensive, I was able to find one that was cheaper, that was a bit further away from me and I was able to get it brought to me. And that's the most important thing. The most important thing is even when you have challenges, that you still make things work in any single way that you can. There's always a way to work around things. So if there's no vending machines in your area, there most likely will be in a further area. So if that is the case, check those areas and you can make arrangements and have them brought to you to your local area. Another thing to consider when buying a vending machine, another frequently asked question is, does the vending machine need a card reader? These days, when it comes to a card reader, when you're first starting out, it is an essential type of machine with a card reader. If you can get one, it certainly is nice and it would be sales. However, at the start, it isn't a requirement at all. Having a vending machine without a card reader will work fine. It's not going to be a massive hindrance or anything like that. A card reader, like I said, it will be sales, but it isn't a requirement. Another thing as well is, if you're buying a vending machine and it doesn't have a card reader, an option as well down the line when you are scaling is certain vending machines can be updated with an aftermarket card reader and have a card reader installed onto the vending machine so you can accept card payments. A company that I would recommend for this is Niax. If you've been to Pure Gym, for example, you might see that on Pure Gym, they have Niax card readers on their vending machines. It's that, that is the company. And when it comes to that inquiry, if you go onto the Niax website, and you submit an inquiry, it will ask for the vending machine's model number and you can see whether the vending machine is compatible to be fitted with an aftermarket card reader. Just always, a nice, it is a nice option to have because it just means that when you're first starting off, you can buy the vending machine as it is and when you want to scale to card, which should be a goal, definitely, it definitely does increase sales when you do. You'll have the option to be able to have an aftermarket card reader installed onto the machine. Now, typically the card reader does cost you between 350 to 400 pounds, but it is a very, very good investment and something that I definitely would consider as you scale down the line. Now, when it comes to moving, ideally you'll be using a moving service. So it can be a full moving service or it can simply be someone that has a van that does moving, things like that, just a moving service like that. It's just a one-off cost. It will cost you about 60, 70 pounds, something like that. And I'll just be done one off now. The one thing that I will advise is if you're getting a service like this, make sure that the person is well equipped to move a vending machine, that they have the right equipment. Normally what they'll need is, they'll need a pallet truck, they'll need to be able to slide a tool underneath the vending machine and kind of like prop it up uh, to move the vending machine safely. It's very, very important that you do check this because at times in my experience, I've had people that do this service and they're not equipped to move vending machines at all. They simply don't consider like how heavy the vending machines are and things like that. When you're communicating with these people for moving services, make sure that you de-emphasize that this is a vending machine. It's a heavy machine and that it needs to be moved properly and safely because if the vending machine is damaged, in most cases, especially if it's more of an individual rather than an actual company, in those cases, if there is some damage, they're not really going to be liable and things like that, or it can be like an issue in terms of like liability and things like that. So you want to make sure that the person that you do choose is fully competent and is able to move the vending machine safely for you. That's the main thing. Another thing when it comes to moving as well is something that you need to check, a very, very simple thing, but take measurements, make sure the vending machine is actually going to fit into the location. Now, the reason why I bring this up and the reason I feel like it's important is because for me, such a small thing, but when I was moving it into my first location, because the location was like sort of like a small location, the entry for the location was very, very narrow and it was a very, very tight fit to get the vending machine in. And in the end, the vending machine did fit in there, but it's just in the case that, well, what if it didn't? For something so small, it can really mess up the whole process and cause like a huge delay. So make sure you take measurements of the vending machine Make sure you take measurements of the door that it's going into, just to make sure that there's enough space and there's not going to be any issues. So when it comes to moving, there are many things that I would check. Another thing as well that I'd also consider, 
Now, it depends on the location you're moving it to. When I moved the vending machine into a shopping center, which is one of the most biggest locations that I put a vending machine in, they wanted me to provide a statement of the moving procedure. Just they wanted to have some details of the moving. Now, I'm only throwing this in for a bit of like extra information. A lot of businesses and a lot of locations, they will not actually require this, but it is something good to think about. Make sure the vending machine is gonna be moved and placed safely to take that precaution for yourself, even if a business doesn't ask for it, because in most cases they won't, but make sure that you have the vending machine moved safely and securely in your own right. So in this section, we're gonna discuss storage of your vending machine. Now, I thought it was important to go over this because of a scenario that you might have. So what you might find is, you may find the vending machine and you may not have a location. And in that case, it's sort of creates a scenario. And the reason why is because you have a vending machine, but you have nowhere to put it. But because vending machines tend to be a bit more difficult to find at times, you may want to buy the vending machine instead of risking it being sold on the market. So in this scenario especially, this is where you consider a storage unit. This is what I did for myself personally with my very first vending machine. So what you'll do is you'll look for a local storage unit. Typically they're inexpensive. You'll probably be paying maybe 60, 70 pound a month for a storage unit. But the idea with a storage unit is it's only temporary. In fact, I actually like having a vending machine in a storage unit. And the reason why is because if you know you're paying storage for the vending machine, it's gonna give you that much more incentive to get a location as quick as possible because the longer you have a sitting in storage, it's not making you money. And second, you're actually paying the storage fee for each month. So I actually like when it's in storage because it gives you that drive to get a location as soon as possible. So yeah, if you do find a vending machine and you'd like to buy it, but you don't have a location yet and you don't know if you can get a location quick enough, that's fine. Buy the vending machine. You can pay someone to move from where it is to the storage unit and keep it in storage till you find a location. And again, just to clarify, once it's in storage, yes, you have a vending machine, which is a plus, it's a positive, it's good, you've made a start, but it is not making you any money. So this is where you start reaching out to even more businesses, to even more locations. This is where you become even more relentless in trying to find a location. So in this section, we're gonna talk about choosing location. Now, when it comes to location, the main thing that I'd advise is honestly, cast a wide net. Ideally, you want to reach out to as many businesses as possible. But to give you an actual number, I would say reach out to 10 to 15 businesses. Make that your goal to do that. So reach out to 10 to 15 businesses and that's going to be your goal. Okay. When it comes to the factors to look for when determining which businesses are good and what businesses work and what don't, it honestly comes down to a few factors. So one factor is foot traffic. Foot traffic is just a term that essentially just means how busy is the location? How many people are going to be walking past the vending machine or walking in and out of the location? So essentially, it's just you keeping in mind how busy is this location? How many people are going in and out of this location? That's something that's important to consider. Another thing that's important to consider is convenience. How convenient is the location for consumers, for customers? For example, if there's limited options around, if there isn't much shops or let's say there is some shops, but the shops close at a certain time, they close early, and there's times where shops are closed. It's things like that that you wanna look out for ideally. So you wanna be looking at foot traffic, you wanna be looking at convenience, how convenient it is for a customer. You wanna be looking at things like waiting times. So let's say for example, if it's a barber shop or hairdresser or something like that, or even like a, a garage, like an auto shop and someone's waiting for their car to be repaired, it's all these kind of factors that you wanna be keeping in mind. Because if a customer is waiting on a location for a while, and especially when there's limited options around them, that's when they're gonna be tempted to get something from a vending machine, things like that. So you're looking for places that have long waiting times, good for traffic, things like that. You wanna be trying to keep these factors in mind when you're choosing locations. But honestly, the reason why I said you should cast a wide net is because this only matters if the businesses respond to you in the first place. It only, I'd only, I'd only look, I'd only focus on these factors if multiple locations are interested, then you can have a choice and actually determine where's the best location to actually put it for your, yourself and what's going to be the most lucrative for you. Or I use these factors when I'm considering commission because when it comes to commission, especially when you're negotiating, if a business is trying to make you pay more commission than what you initially expected, 
if you think about, well, how lucrative is this for me? How good is the foot traffic? How good is the waiting times? How good is the convenience? Things like that. Then you can determine whether you should pay like more commission and things like that. So ideally, when it comes to actually choosing location, even though those factors are important, I wouldn't focus on them so much until it actually comes to things like commission, which we will discuss. Ideally, when it comes to location, reach out to as many businesses as you can. Again, as an actual goal, as an actual figure, reach out to 10 to 15 businesses. Now, when it comes to actually reaching out to them, there's a number of methods that you can use. You can email the businesses, you can go in person, you can call the businesses, you can use social media, you can DM them on Instagram page, message them on Facebook. There's so many methods that you can use. Honestly, what I'd recommend is using a mixture of these methods and just testing what works best for yourself. Normally, within the vending machine industry, people would always advise that you should go in person, but going in person tends to be time consuming. And at times it isn't even that much more effective. It is good in the sense that you do build rapport and you do get that face-to-face -face interaction and things like that, but it isn't essential. For example, using phone calls saves so much more time. You can do from the comfort of your own home and it's so much more effective and in terms of like saving times and things like that. But then again, doing it over the phone is a little, a little bit less impersonal. The thing that I'm trying to highlight is with any single method, it does have its benefits and does have its disadvantages. But for this reason, that's why you want to really tweak it to work out what's best for you in terms of like your approach. The approach honestly doesn't matter. What matters more is how many businesses you actually get in touch with. That's the main thing. I have secured locations from emailing, which it has been much more effort than me actually going in person and things like that. So honestly, when it comes to your approach, a lot of methods can work. Just the most important thing is they're reaching out to these businesses. If you do not like going in person and you don't like doing that, or you don't have the time for that, absolutely no trouble. Like I said previously, the most important thing is that you make things happen in any single way that you can. If you sit from the comfort of your own home and you call a list of businesses, you have 10 businesses and you call each of them and give them your proposal and you can do that within an evening and that works for you, then do that. If you don't like speaking on the phone and you want to email the businesses, make sure that if you're emailing them, that you're sending formal, that you message them formally and that you send professional. That's the most important thing. Same thing with if you're sending a DM, similar to like an email. If you're DMing a business, try and have a business page beforehand. Again, not essential, but it is nice. But even if you're emailing them from, if sorry, if you're DMing them from your personal account on Instagram or Facebook, again, just try and sound professional. If you are going in person, bring business cards with you so that when they ask you to leave a contact, you can hand them your business card. So it's important to look professional as well with whatever method that you do choose because this is a business transaction, especially if you're like me, if you are younger, when you walk into a business and you have a business proposal, people might not take you as serious because you are quite young. And for that reason, that's why it's important to be able to match that with professionalism, to actually come across as a competent individual that's worth doing business with. So again, when it comes to all those methods, the method itself doesn't matter. So many methods that you can use. The most important thing is that you're reaching out to as many businesses as possible. So when it comes to location, you're gonna need a pitch. Now, when it comes to a pitch, I'm not gonna give you any script, nothing like that. And the reason why is because simply you don't need one. It'll just confuse things more. You do not need one at all. What works best is to keep things simple and professional. I'll say it again, simple and professional. That is what works best. That is all you need. If you call a business, all you need to say is, hi, I'm calling to see if there's any interest in having a vending machine placed. I can see that you don't have one. Obviously, you'd say this in the case of you actually having been to location before and seeing that they don't have one. You'd say that then. But if you haven't been to location at all, keep it even shorter. Just say, hi, I'm calling to find that and see if there's any interest in having a vending machine placed at your location. Something that I do do as well sometimes is just to like mix it up, not a huge tweak. Now, something that I actually do to mix it up sometimes is I'll actually say this. I would say, hi, I'm calling about the vending machines. And the reason why I would say this is because as soon as you say that, the person you're speaking to on the phone will be like, the vending machines, they will assume that there's already a conversation going on about it and they'll be much more attentive to what you have to say. And then if they sound confused, then you'll be like, yeah, I'm just calling to find out if there's any interest in having one place. 
Now, the reason why I like to do this is, like I said, it just makes me think that there's already been a conversation and this is like a follow-up or something like that. So I guess I'm much more attentive and they're much more responsive to you because normally when it comes to like vending machines, the person, especially if you're calling, the person who you're speaking to is not going to be the decision maker. So if you're calling them and you're saying to them, hi, I'm calling about the vending machine, they're going to be all, they're going to assume that you spoke to someone who's higher above them and this is like a follow-up call and therefore this is important and they're going to be much more responsive towards it. But again, this is always something that I like to do sometimes. Honestly, keep it simple, keep it professional and you can mix it up. Honestly, what you say doesn't matter too much. Just keep it simple and professional and that's honestly what works the most effective. You don't need to confuse it in any single way. Use that simple line, show, show your intention and just reach out to as many businesses as possible and see who responds. That's the most important thing. What you say honestly doesn't matter too much. You don't need a huge library script at all. Simple and professional works best. So in this section, we're going to be talking all about commission. Now commission is a conversation you're going to have when you find a location that's interested in your proposal. So at this point, when it comes to location and commission, we see within like the vending machine industry, you, something that I do see commonly is a lot of other vending business owners saying that they pay zero commission. Now, paying zero commission would be beautiful. It'd be completely ideal. I would say the reason why is because if you're paying no commission, that means 100% of the profit goes completely to you. And I mean, this is great if you can do it, but what I found in my experience, and I've had this, I've tried this approach. I have tried, I have tried that in my approach to try and get businesses to agree to zero commission. However, in my experience personally, most times businesses do not go for this. So what I would recommend when it comes to commission is if you can, obviously that'd be a hundred percent ideal. If you can try that angle, if you'd like to, the way that you want to try that is instead of talking about commission, when you're pitching or when you're negotiating, you can kind of emphasize that it's going to be a service for, that's going to benefit the customers. It's going to benefit their staff. You really want to highlight how much of a benefit the vending machine is going to be just in general. And if you can emphasize that just enough, possibly a business can agree to zero commission and you can have the vending machine placed there for free. Now, I just wanted to go over that because obviously that is an idea, but I wouldn't focus too much on that. I wouldn't be too hopeful on that. Personally, in my experience, even though I've tried that approach with a few locations, I found that a lot of businesses do want commission. And I mean, it not only makes sense, right? They're business owners, they're interested in profit, they're interested in making money. And when it comes to them dealing with you, it isn't no difference. The same way you want to make profit, they want to make some profit as well. So most businesses will be interested in a commission. So when it comes to actually talking about commission, ideally the figure is between 10 and 15%. That's what you should be offering. That'd be an ideal figure. However, at times when it comes to negotiating, some businesses will want more. Now, when some businesses are pushing you for 20, sometimes even 25% commission, this is where you need to be asking yourself, how lucrative is this location to me? Is this location really valuable? And that's why you want to be referring to those factors I mentioned previously, such as how has the foot traffic? How has the convenience? Ultimately, you want to ask yourself, how lucrative is this location? Is it a very good location? And if so, in that sense, I would say, if they're trying to offer you, um, if they're trying to make you pay like a higher commission and you find a location lucrative, then you can stretch it a little bit. You can agree to a higher commission because ultimately if it's a good location, then it will pay off. If the location isn't worth it, then try and be a bit more firm because if you're agreeing to pay a higher commission for a location that isn't worth it as much, the issue you're going to have is it's just going to eat into your profits and you will feel that. So it's up to your own discretion. But yeah, general rule of thumb is offer between 10, 15%, start as low as possible. Ideally lowball them, start as low as possible because you want to avoid giving up as much commission as you possibly can because it maximizes your profits. And in the case that they are trying to negotiate with you, that's where you consider how valuable is this to me? How good is the location? And if it's valuable, stretch it a little bit, but 
try not to get taken advantage of. Don't let them control the negotiation when it comes to commission. Try and be as tight with commission as you possibly can because the lower commission you pay, the more it's gonna benefit your pockets. So by this stage, the hard part is done. Honestly, from when you place the vending machine, how your life looks after as a vending machine owner, it is so much more different. That initial process is more difficult. And the reason why I actually like that difficulty, to be honest, is because if the bar was so low, then every single person would be doing it. It's good that things have challenges. It makes things worth it. So after you overcome that initial process, of finding the location, finding the vending machine and placing it, it becomes so much more easier after that. All it is is mainly maintenance. And that's exactly what we're gonna talk about right now. So initially when you first place the vending machine, you're gonna to need to stock the vending machine. So when it comes to stock, typically the best place that I recommend is going to your local wholesalers. So going to somewhere like Costco, becoming a member for Costco and going there, buying things in bulk. That's gonna be the best way to ensure that you're getting good profit margins. So I'd advise buying things in bulk, definitely. Costco, perfect. Over time, depending on your relationships, something I do have for myself personally is I actually have a direct supplier now that actually is slightly cheaper. Now, places like Costco still does work for me, perfect, but I was able to build a relationship and I have a direct supplier now, Some, something more like local, something a bit more under the radar, but it's, um a private sort of like um, just dist dist distributor. So I get my stock from them now and it's slightly cheaper, which again, increases profits. But again, it is an essential. Somewhere like Costco, become a member. You can do that publicly. Somewhere like Costco is absolutely fine. All you need to do is just make sure that you're making good profit margins. Now, when you are buying stock, something that is important is when you're buying things in bulk, especially, calculate the breakdown. Make sure that you're making good profit off each product because sometimes certain products are more lucrative than others, which is what you want to put your main focus on. You know, you want to offer a wide range of selection, but you also want to focus around products that make you money as well and making the most profit at that. So another thing that I wanted to mention when it comes to stock is if you are considering buying stock from places like Home Bargains and BNM, buying out like multi-packs and things like that, do ensure that you're buying products that don't have labeling that says multi-pack not to be sold separately on it. You want to avoid products that have that labeling on it. It is very tempting to buy these products because usually it does work out much cheaper when it is within a multi-pack, but just to keep up with legal aspects of things like that, it's a good practice to avoid buying products with that labeling as well. Another thing when it comes to the actual stock that you're buying for the vending machine is avoiding things like energy drinks because energy drinks cannot be sold to children under the age of 16. At times, you probably have seen it yourself, there will be vending machines that will sell energy drinks in them. So honestly, it's up to your own discretion, but what I would advise is avoiding selling energy drinks at all if you can avoid that. So once you've bought stock for the vending machine, something that you should note as you get stock for the vending machine over time is whenever you buy new stock for the vending machine, always pull the old stock forward so that the items that are due to expire first will always be sold first. Now, this is just as you go along the line, but it's just to make sure that you're always, in terms of like dates and things like that, that you're always giving your products up to date and things like that. It's just a very, very simple routine. Just always bring your old stock forward and it'll just make sure your items are always within date because you don't want to lose profit by having items go out of date. It's something that's very, very easy to avoid. So it's just a good practice to keep up with by having a little stock rotation whenever you do put new stock into the vending machine. Okay, so now that we've talked about placing the vending machine and putting some stock into it, let's talk about setting the actual vending machine up. Now, when it comes to this, there are so many different models of vending machines. And what I would recommend, especially if you bought a used machine, is if you take the model number and do a quick Google search, you should be able to find the model number for the vending machine. Now, when you get the model number, you'll be able to download the instructions. And if you get the instructions for the machine, and follow them. It will tell you everything you need to know about that vending machine in particular, in terms of setting it up, in terms of changing the prices, um, all the features like that. It doesn't take too much technical skills. If you're decent with technology and good with 
I'm not the best with technology. Like, I wouldn't be like extraordinary with technology, but obviously, like, I do have like a good understanding at the same time, and I'm sure we all have the same kind of understanding. So it doesn't take that much like technical skills, um, to work it out. And you just follow the instructions. You'll be able to set the prices, um, check other features and things like that. But the most important thing is getting the instructions, and it'll all be explained within there. That's honestly the easiest way to go about it. And when it comes to this as well, this is why it's so important to initially check the vending machine when you're first buying it, because when it comes to small things like changing the price and things like that, it's quite easy to do, quite easy to follow instructions. But if the vending machine has any other kind of issue with it that you haven't checked, for example, if a vending machine slot isn't vending correctly, something like that, it can be much, much more difficult to work that out. And at that time, you need to call in a specialist which is something that I also want to talk about as well. So something that I would recommend is, in the case of emergencies, and just as a backup, it's good to build up a list of local contacts. So when you deplace the vending machine, it doesn't have to be done initially, but if you just take your area and just look for vending machine repair um, technicians just around you, just so you have some contacts, and uh, look, things can happen. And the worst case scenario, if your vending machine breaks down, at least you're not stressing out, you know exactly who to go to but this is just more so as a as it's just this is just so, more so as a bit of a measure we do take preventive measures to prevent against this in the first place which is why from the first day we check the vending machine to make sure we're not going to have problems and the thing about vending machines as well is vending machines are great machines they are built to last so if you buy a vending machine and you ensure from the day one that it's working correctly you're not going to have too much problems going forward the main issue that you can have and the worst issue to have with a vending machine is when you buy a vending machine and you don't take your time to test it and you buy the vending machine and now you have the vending machine on site you have it at the business and now it's giving you some trouble that's it it's, that gives you the worst start when you test the vending machine and make sure that it's working and you place it you will not have issues going forward all it is is just simple cleaning simple maintenance and in your own time from when you place the vending machine just do a quick Google search, list of local technicians, have a few just saved, just a few numbers to have in the back of your head. And if you ever have an issue with the vending machine down the line, which doesn't happen often, but like I said, anything can happen, you know exactly who to go to and you'll be able to get that resolved. Within business, any single business, things can happen, but the most important thing is dealing with it in the best way that you can and being equipped to deal with whatever comes at you. That's the most important thing. So another thing that I wanted to mention when it comes to stock is if you are considering buying stock from places like Home Bargains and BNM, buying out of like multi-packs and things like that, do ensure that you're buying products that don't have labeling that says multi-pack not to be sold separately on it. You want to avoid products that have that labeling on it. Another part of maintenance is cleaning. Like I said in one of the earlier sections, that vending machine represents you. It's your business investment, you're placed in a location, you've dealt with the owner for the business, this represents you. So it's important that you take care of it and you clean it. And it's also important to clean it in terms of maintenance and things like that as well, because if you have a vending machine and you're cleaning it, you're not letting dust build up and things like that, it also keeps the vending machine running much more smoothly, prevents any things like noise coming from fans and things like that. So once a week, no more than two weeks, get an all-purpose multi-cleaner and just give the vending machine a nice clean, get all the dust off it, keep it looking nice. What I want to discuss in this section is insurance. Insurance is another frequently asked question. Now, when it comes to insurance, it isn't mandatory in most cases. Again, it's up to the location's discretion. Some locations will require it, some locations won't, but regardless of regardless of whether a location is requiring it or not, it is something that you should, should still consider. And the reason why is because ultimately, insurance protects you and protects your business and protects customers as well. There's different options that you can get for insurance. So one of the most important ones that I'd consider at the bare minimum is you can get public liability insurance. So when it comes to public liability insurance, that insurance is what covers members of the public. So if a member of the public has an incident with one of your vending machines, it means that 
they'll be insured in that event and it's very very good because it just protects people from ha putting claims against you and things like that and it's just a very very good level of protection so at the very minimum if you are considering getting insurance i strongly recommend getting public liability insurance just a very very good very very good for protection now i will go through some other insurance options so you can get insurance that will cover damage um towards yourself any like accidents towards yourself now this is something that again it's an option but i wouldn't really go too much into this most likely you will not really be injuring yourself and things like that but again things can happen it is an option as well and then final thing is in some cases you can also get insurance to protect your vending machines in a case of vandalism and things like that it is a good option again to consider but one thing i also factor in as well is if you're placing it on a location and the location is secure and the location has cameras and things like that then that that also is a form of protection as well so if the location does have these things then it creates the need of you having to get insurance it lowers that so much so if it is a good location it is secure and there's cameras and things like that i wouldn't worry so so ultimately, when it comes to insurance, insurance, it isn't a requirement. It's just an option for you to consider because it actually can protect you, your business, your vending machines and things like that. So that's why you should consider it. When it comes to certain locations, it just depends on the location. It happens sometimes that a location may need it. So you can consider it just in case, but it isn't a requirement. If you do want to browse around insurance and just have a look at like what kind of insurance you can get and just quotes and things like that, it's as simple as just doing a quick Google search. You just type in vending machine insurance, uh, business insurance, and just uh, type in like vending machine operator. You should be able to find some insurance options for you. And you can just double check and see what kind of policy works best for you. Again, in most cases, you're not. Now, a very important aspect that I wanted to discuss is licensing. The reason I wanted to discuss licensing greatly is because when it comes to licensing, especially, there's very, very limited information. It's quite a gray area and it can be quite confusing to know what to do in terms of like licensing. It's a really big question. Do you, need, do you need a license or do you not need one? So I just wanted to discuss that. So when it comes to a license, no, you do not need a license. You do not require a license. What's important is permission and obviously we're gonna obtain permission. The reason why you need permission is because when you're placing a vending machine within a business location, that's private land. So you need permission from the business owners to place it there. That's mainly what you need. You don't need permission. It'd be very, very different if, for example, if you were placing it in a public area, like if it was like a hot dog stand or something like that, then that's a different scenario, which is not what we're doing. So in terms of like another legal aspect we're gonna talk about is gonna be tax. A very common question that I get is, do you need to register this business before you start? Now, in most cases, no, you don't need to register. Registering is more so for tax purposes, which we're going to discuss. Now, what I recommend is if you go on to gov.co.uk and just check the um, tax laws just in your certain area. For me personally, in the area that I am within the UK, you can make up to £1,000 before you need to declare tax. So ultimately what that means is it isn't until a vending machine business makes you a £1,000 they need to worry about like registering it. So when you're first starting off, you don't need to be worried about like registering and taxing things like that. But what I would recommend is go on to gov.co.uk, have a quick browse and just see what the information is for you in particular. Normally it is quite universal in the UK, isn't it mainly the same thing, but just double check to keep yourself right. But in most cases, especially when you're first starting off, you're gonna have a tax-free threshold, meaning that you don't have to worry about registering at the start. It's only when the business starts making you some money and things like that, they're gonna start thinking about tax and things like that. So when you're starting out, it's fine. Nothing has to be worried about. Big thing, cash collection. One of your favorite days as well. So when it comes to cash collection, it's different with each business. Typically, you'll do cash collection once a month. And the way that that'll work is you'll collect the cash, count it. And if you've agreed to a certain commission figure, you'll pay the owner that commission but that's something that you work out between you. Normally it's done once a month. Some businesses do it every three months. Some do it even um, less often than that. It's just honestly between 
you and the owner, but normally like once a month is kind of like the standard way that goes in terms of cash collection. So yeah, all you need to do is just collect the cash and then pay the commission. And another thing when you're collecting the cash as well is always do make sure that the coin mechanism, which is the part of the vendor machine that accepts the currency, always make sure that the coin mechanism is filled up with change. If you need to get change, if you head up over to your local um, if you're to your local bank and you can even request it online before you go into the bank. Some banks are different, but if you just go into your bank and just get some small change, just get a few um, change bags and just all of your um, change really, 50p's, 20p's, 10's, 5's, just all the change really, and uh, make sure you have some change on you and just put that into the coin mechanism just so it's always filled up so the customers can get change back from the vending machine. Another thing when it comes to cash collection day is you will have a lot of coins. Something that I would recommend is if you go to the bank, a lot of banks have coin machines and if you put your coins within the coin machine, they'll count the machines up quickly so that you can put the money directly into your account. And this is completely free of charge. You can go into a coin star. However, a coin star is going to charge you around 10% to count the coins, which we don't really want to be doing. So the best place I'd recommend is getting your coins counted within the machines, within the actual banks themselves. So that is your day-to-day -day process. And now I want to talk about going forward. So at that stage, you've done the process, you've successfully placed the vending machine, you know the full process for that. And like I said at the very start, the most important thing is scaling. That is the process. There isn't really any much more to it than that. That is the blueprint. That is what you need to do. That is the main element to starting a vending machine business. The main thing is starting because once you get to the, once you get familiar with the process of placing a vending machine, it becomes so much more easier because you know exactly what you're doing. And the beauty of that is it makes scaling so much easier. And like I said before, the power is all in scaling. Once you know the process, you can repeat it. And now from having one vending machine, making you some nice money on the side, you can scale it to multiple machines and you can make a much nicer income on the side. So going forward, it's just about scaling, repeating the process so you can make much more profit going forward and really establish yourself within this business. Something that I felt was really important to highlight as well is, if I can do this, so can you. It's like any single thing in any single business. If someone else has done it before, then there's no reason why you can't. Nothing separates you from anyone.